How to keep? Is there any, any? Is there none such? Nowhere known some bow or brooch or braid or brace, lace, latch or catch or key to keep back beauty? Keep it, beauty, beauty, beauty from vanishing away. Oh, is there no frowning of these wrinkles? Ranked wrinkles deep down, no waving off of these most mournful messengers, still messengers, sad and stealing messengers of grey. No, there's none, there's none. Oh no, there's none, nor can you long be what you now are called fair. Do what you may do, what do what you may. And wisdom is early to despair. Be beginning since no, nothing can be done to keep at bay age and age's evils, hoar hair, ruck and wrinkle, drooping, dying, death's worst, winding sheets, tombs and worms, and tumbling to decay. So be beginning, be beginning to despair. Oh, there's none. No, 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 there's none. Be beginning to despair, to despair, 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 despair. Spare the golden echo. Spare, there is one. Yes, I have one. Hush there. Only not within the seeing of the sun, not within the singeing of the strong sun, tall suns tinging, or treacherous attainting of the earth's air, somewhere elsewhere there is our well. One, one. Yes, I can tell such a key, I do know such a place, where whatever's prized and passes of us, everything that's fresh, and fast flying of us seems to a sweet of us, and swiftly away with, done away with, undone, undone, done with, soon done with, and yet dearly and dangerously sweet of us, the dimpled water dimpled, not by morning marked face, the flower of beauty, fleece of beauty, too, too apt to, ah, too fleet, never fleets more, fastened with the tenderest truth to its own best being and its loveliness of youth. It is an everlasting of, oh, it is an all youth. Come then, your ways and airs and looks, locks, maiden gear, gallantry and gaiety and grace, winning ways, airs, innocent, maiden manners, sweet looks, loose locks, long locks, love locks, gay gear, going gallant, girl, grace. Resign them, sign them, seal them, send them, Motion them with breath, and with sighs soaring, soaring sighs. Deliver them, beauty in the ghost. Deliver it early now, long before death. Give beauty back, beauty, beauty, beauty. Back to God, beauty's self and beauty's giver. See, not a hair is, not an eyelash, not the least lash lost. 
Every hair is hair of the head numbered. Nay, what we had light-handed left in surly the mere mould will have waked and have waxed and have walked with the wind what while we slept. This side, that side, hurling a heavy-headed hundredfold, what while we, while we slumbered. Oh, then, weary, then, why should we tread? Oh, why are we so haggard at the heart, so care-coiled, care-killed, so fagged, so fashed, so cogged, so cumbered, when the thing we freely forfeit is kept with fonder a care, fonder a care kept than we could have kept it, kept far with fonder a care, and we, we should have lost it, finer, fonder a care kept, where kept, do but tell us where kept, where, yonder, as high as that, we follow now, we follow yonder, yes, yonder, yonder, yonder. The relation between the poem I've just read you and the music to which you've just listened is an interesting one. Almost certain they were composed at roughly speaking the same time. The poems, the Leaden Echo and the Golden Echo by Gerard Manley Hopkins, were written for a play which was never completed, never produced, never published. Gerard Manley Hopkins himself never published a single poem, so far as I know. And indeed, his poetry itself was not known until 1918, his friend Robert Bridges, who much admired his poetic talents, printed a few in uh, a, uh, an anthology after Hopkins had died. Hopkins was totally unknown. And there were really two quite different reasons for it. Hopkins, a young man who had been to Oxford, became a Catholic and then entered the Jesuit order. And his superiors within the Jesuit order thought that he was better employed teaching elementary grammar to Irishmen than writing poetry. They deprecated his poetic talent and certainly did not encourage him to publish anything. With Wagner, the situation was somewhat different. Wagner was not very well recognized in his early years in the 1840s. He didn't have the immediate success which attended Giuseppe Verdi, but by the 1870s and 1880s, Wagner and Wagnerites and Wagnerism had become enormously powerful, substantial, just as his music was so enormously powerful and substantial. It took people time to get used to Wagner, but Wagner eventually became official art. He became official art after the sort of struggle which also attended the art of Henry Gibson. And we must remember that as well as uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins and Wagner, Ibsen is one of the great figures of the 1870s, 1880s. Ibsen, the great uh, pseudo-anti-pro-feminist, uh, the Hedda Gabler man, the Pierre Gint man, uh, the great social critic, the great combiner of realism and symbolism, a combiner of realism and symbolism in drama just as uh, we should find that at some stages Cezanne is a combiner of realism and symbolism and many other things in art. And Ibsen, you see, raised a tremendous furore and had to be digested. Well, the slowest to get digested of these trio was, of course, Manly Hopkins, and perhaps this was because in some respects he was the most innovative. He actually does the thing which the Impressionists were doing and which the post-Impressionists did and which then, of course, the Fauvists and the Cubists and then the Dadaists and Surrealists did, which was to entirely alter the language of his particular art. And he alters it in a deeper and more profound and more moving way than Walt Whitman, who might indeed be considered a fourth. Walt Whitman, more easily digestible, sooner entering uh, the higher realms of Parnassus in the eyes of the public. 
the sprung rhythm, as it's called, of uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, and I suppose you must have noticed the strangeness of the rhythm of that poetry. It's totally different from uh, the normal titumming uh, of English poetry, or the normal titty-tumming of English poetry, or the normal titum 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 titty tum tum titum titum titty tum You know, uh, Longfellow was a very favorite poet in the 19th century, and you think of his regular silly titty titty tappy 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 rhythms, and then you think of the extraordinary Margaret, are you grieving, or Golden Grove, and leaving, of uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins, whose favorite, my favorite Hopkins line, is long live the weeds and the wilderness yet. You notice that one of the things that Hopkins is doing is moving towards not simply a completely different rhythmic structure for English verse, but he's moving towards that form of English verse which has been totally forgotten for hundreds of years, which really depends a very great deal uh, on alliteration. Your bows, your brooches, your braids, etc. Uh, so that he is altering the language most profoundly. And he is exactly at the opposite end of official art. And what I want to do today, first of all, is to start talking, and can we have the lights down and the screen down, uh, to talk about official art. Because I think one of the things that you have to, if you want to understand the relationship between uh, modern and official art, you have to go back to the 1860s and 1870s. Impressionist art was unofficial art. The row starts because Manet gets put in the Salon des Refusés. What we have then is a clearer statement. It goes back, of course, in a way to uh, Corbet, making his own uh, one-man show next to the Universal Exhibition of uh, uh, 1855, the Parisian Exhibition. Well, here is an early Monet, and as you can see, the early Monet is not deeply different from many Courbet's. Its language remains a recognizable language which people slowly had got used to and were getting used to. Though in the 1860s it was still somewhat unfamiliar. A harmless landscape like this, while not part of official art, was not violently anti-official. Uh, but by the time you get to the end of Monet's career, to a painting like this, the language has changed so much the expectation of the ordinary viewer to see something which you might see through an ordinary window. Instead of having your nose rubbed, washed, wetted, hmm, uh, assaulted by the splendid, if slightly turgid scent uh, of a lily pond, hmm, that sense of a single plane, of a single color. Uh, and we are now quite used to paintings which are so definitely so very, very blue. But uh, this is really very difficult to make official art. Of course, by the time that Monet arrived at his old age and was dripping with uh, lilies and cataract, he had two operations uh, near the end of his life, he had become such a grand old man that the great other grand old man of France, Georges Clemenceau, the prime minister who was known as a tiger, used to come and visit him and ask about his uh, cataract. And the late Nymphia series, which is a great series of an environmental set of paintings which went all the way around you and really environed you in the midst of the lily pond, could in the 1920s become official art. But uh, in the later part of the 19th century, the tension between progressive art, or art for art's sake, or art for artists, or art within the cognoscenti, and art for the prime ministers, and the dukes, and the senators, and the grandees, was becoming, on the contrary, more and more profound. And one of the most fascinating things, of course, is to look briefly at the career of Whistler. Now, Whistler was an American who then lived in France and then lived in England. If you want to get some flavor of that international world, you might well read a book which became enormously popular in the 1890s by George du Maurier called Trilby. And it depicts the art scene in Paris in the early 1860s, which had, of course, become an international one. Winslow Homer went there, uh, and Whistler went there. And Whistler, of course, was, in fact, not simply a very innovative painter, but somebody who delighted in annoying everybody. Because he himself was very annoyed. Mm -hmm. you, know, the very famous, you know the very famous remark which uh, he made uh, to Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde said to Whistler, when Whistler had been particularly funny, Oh, Jimmy, I do wish I'd said that. And Jimmy Whistler said to Oscar, Oh, you will, Oscar, you will. <laughs> uh, now, a person, you see, who simply couldn't resist all that wonderful, funny opportunity. And, in fact, 
Uh, I've told you about the great Whistler Ruskin trial uh, of 1879, when uh, you know Whistler finally said, uh, "You're paying uh, not for two hours' work, but for the experience of a lifetime." Lifetime. Whistler enjoyed being anti-official. He could because, you see, he was an exile, he was outside the mainstream. Uh, he could say things that no English person could easily say uh, in England. He could say things that no French person could easily say in France. And he had a sovereign contempt for the unwashed, the great unwashed. That, my dear, is you. You may think that you're washed, but any Victorian uh, dandy would call you the great unwashed. Uh, and Whistler was, amongst other things, dandiacal. And you can see here, in a vertical way, he's doing what Monet had does in a horizontal way. He is blocking up all sense of space, all sense of distance, all deep illusionism, any deep movement into space, and he's really fundamentally presenting you with a single plane. He's already fulfilling what Maurice Denny wanted fulfilled in the 1890s. Before anything else, says Maurice Denny, a, a painting is an arrangement of colors on a flat surface. Well, here is already, before 1890, an arrangement of colors on a flat surface. And here is another Whistler which, like many of the Impressionists, is obviously deeply indebted to Japanese art. But unlike the, many of the Impressionists, it's not painted on the spot. It is painted as a nocturne. It's painted with this very strong sense of it being akin to music. Whistler really is uh, the father of Kandinsky in a great many ways. And of course, it's simplified uh, in an extraordinary degree to a very bold silhouetted shape. And now I'm going to show you the last of the Whistlers, which is the fireworks at Cremorne Garden. And this was the one which caused the particular amount of rage uh, on the part of Ruskin. And do you see uh, the color restriction is extraordinary. There's no attempt really to express uh, an illusion, but to abstract from that. Mm? And remember those Whistler's remarks about uh, uh, the, the, the people who, the person who composes uh, a composition which consists of the repetition of F, 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 F. He wants to select, and he says, painting directly from nature is like sitting on all the notes of a piano. <laughs> Do you see? So selection is absolutely central to him, and he pays the price. He is bankrupted in 1879, 1880. He flits between Paris and London. He's well known as a wit. He's much loved by Lily Langtry and so on and so forth. But he does not succeed officially. And I want you now to think a little bit about official art. And architecture, of course, tends to have to be more official than the other arts because officials are going to have to pay for it. That is why most architecture in the 19th and 20th century is so dreadfully awful because it's all bought by bankers bad-tasted bankers and silly committees and so on. And what is interesting, of course, is that if you take the late 19th century, what do you discover? You discover a, a superheated nationalism. And superheated nationalism is not the best basis for art because it is propagandistic, because it is uh, dishonest, uh, and because it has to swagger. And, my dears, this is a palace of justice built for the small country, Belgium, you wouldn't have thought that Belgium would have enough crooks to justify anything like this. Mm -hmm. I mean, just imagine, you know, you're a minor pickpocket. Mm -hmm. You stole some candy from Woolworths. Mm -hmm. You know, you pulled the center out of somebody else's McDonald burger. Uh, and you have to, you have to, uh, and this is what, mm, this is by a man called Polart. And two things, really. First of all, you can see how pompous, how enormously pompous it is. But of course, that ministered to the notion that Belgium was one of the great European powers bearing the white man's burden, and in fact, of course, penetrating the heart of darkness, and in fact, of course, treating all the peoples who lived on the Congo as though they were worth less than a single cent's worth of India rubber because, of course, that's what the Belgians did in the latter half of the 19th century. Uh, they gormandized themselves on ruining uh, the life of Central Africa. And so, a hollow sham, you might well say. It's a hollow sham, which is also, of course, quite clearly what we would call neo-baroque. And indeed, it bears some kind of vague, faint resemblance 
to the domes of Michelangelo, uh, the colonnades and colonnettes of Bernini, and even of that sage and suggestive Sir Christopher Wren. Uh, well, uh, the municipal court of Santa Cruz is somewhat less daunting. Uh, even more central, perhaps, is the next building I go to show you, but I thought that it would be well to remind you the relationship between official buildings and official art. This is by Jerome, and it is a classical conversation. You see the classical col columns, and this kind of painting was enormously successful in the Salon in Paris and in the Royal Academy in London. Let's have a look at the next. It is interesting that Jerome himself not only painted scenes from ancient history, but he also painted scenes from the French uh, 17th century. And here is L'Eminence Grise, I, uh, that's to say Père Joseph, the uh, advisor of Richelieu, and you're given a sort of 17th century staircase. But what's much more interesting is you're given such a view of bureaucracy in the 19th century. Mm. Oh, my lord, oh, certainly I'll lick your boots ten times over. Uh, and you get that in the world of Flaubert, you get that in the world of Zola, you get that in the world of Guy de Maupassant. And intensely rich. Have you any idea of what a late 19th century dinner was like in the upper classes? 12, 14 courses. My mother used to tell me that when she was young, there were never less than seven wine glasses hmm? for the seven different wines, and that you never came anywhere near your neighbor at the dinner table because there were so many knives and forks that people sat three or four feet apart. Mm -hmm. And it was quite an effort to kick somebody under the table. Uh, a kind of richness and vulgarity uh, which I think really rises to a superb and tremendous crescendo with this famous building uh, designed by Charles Garnier and built from uh, the late 1860s well into the 1870s. This is the Belle Epoque. This is a time when Paris is becoming, you see, itself the center of also an African empire with Zouars and Spais and all that kind of thing and Indochina, Tonkin, uh, the whole notion of Europeans being able to dominate the world and you cannot dominate the world adequately if you don't have multinational corporations or opera houses. The 19th century dominated the world through gigantic wedding cake opera houses mm, uh, and enormous uh, prima donnas. Mm. I imagine that the average weight of Patty uh, and Co, Melba, all, and you think of Melba, you know you sometimes eat a, pe eat, eat a peach Melba or have Melba toast. You know who they're named for? They're named for Madame Nellie Melba who was an opera singer. I suppose it's not impossible to think that we might eventually eat, uh, what's the name, a Pavarotti? Mm? What do you think a Pavarotti would be? A kind of rather second-rate sausage? Mm? <laughs> uh, but anyhow, you can, see, you, can see, you can see that the opera house has to be enormous and grand and vast, and it has to be smothered in the richest sculpture you can possibly imagine. Uh, look at these huge lumps of carving here, 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 just about everywhere. Uh, and uh, uh, let's have a look at the next. That brings you a little bit closer. Uh, my father used to tell me that when, uh, just after the First World War, he was stationed in Paris, hmm, he tried to go to the opera, and the people who wanted, who, to, from whom he'd have to buy a ticket would say, please, monsieur, open your red angot, open your coat. And they would look. And if he didn't have evening dress on, they would say, no, no, monsieur, c'est You can't go. You aren't wearing evening dress. You can't possibly go into our opera house. My own experiences is that I've only ever been able to penetrate to the very top of the opera house, sitting in very provincial company, two large ladies from Bordeaux with the biggest hips imaginable, and I was squashed in between them. But anyhow, uh, you look, at the, you, look at the, you look at the interior and you see yet more sculpture. You can't have just an, uh, a, a formal abstract object holding up a torch. You have to have bronze boys and bronze girls. Uh, and uh, oh, much of it, of course, is gilded. Much of it, of course, is made of the most elementary stucco. It is a grand neo barockery which was finally redecorated in the 1960s with Chagall's paintings in the ceiling. And they don't quite go, do they? Uh, they're very, very charming, but this is really what the Paris Opera is about, and you had to wear your ti tiaras and your diamonds and so on and so forth. And, I mean, you know, you could not weigh less than 16 or 17 stone. It's impossible to smoke a mere cigarette in the Paris Opera. The smallest thing you can smoke is a two-foot cigar. 
because it is official art. Uh, and the official art, of course, spreads eventually to America. And I'm showing you some drawings now of the great exposition, the international, the first sort of great international fair in Chicago in 1893. Now, 1893 is not such a long time ago, but look at it. It is obviously a mixture of uh, Brunelleschi's Florentine Dome with touches of St. Peter's, touches of St. Paul's, touches of Polart's Palais de Justice. And here we see some very, very jolly uh, bits of sculpture and so on and so forth. And then triumphal columns and everything you can possibly imagine. And of course, gondolas from Venice, uh, very suitable in Chicago. Here's another building. Mm? And once more, probably made out of ice cream, most of these. They look as though they're made out of ice cream. This is a Pennsylvania building from that exposition in 1893. And of course, every Chicagoan went to it and was absolutely astonished at the wealth, the plentifulness, the opulence, and the awfulness of it, and adored it. Uh, and so you can see that the Impressionists, the post-Impressionists, are going to have to struggle against such a massive structure of official art. Inside the exposition, it looks a little bit more like the Crystal Palace, doesn't it? But it's fascinating. You see, this is 40-something this is years after the Crystal Palace, and yet neo barockery is everywhere in official art. And that remains true to the 1920s and the 1930s and merges with fascist art in a very straight kind of way. Here we are. This is, this is, this is New York, isn't it, 1910? The great Pe Pennsylvania station by McKim, Mead, and White. And it isn't neo baroque it's neoclassic again. Could you believe that that is 1910 instead of BC 200? Uh, and that there's a railway behind it. But again, it, it, is, it satisfies the craving for magnificence and grandeur and historical trappings that is part of official art. And of course, lots of extremely gifted, marvelous and extraordinary artists got caught up in this. Hmm? They believed in a future which consisted of rank imperialism, uh, opulent aristocracies, grand plutocrats. Uh, and actually, many people still believe in it. That's the inside. And you can see that they can do a very good engineering job if they want to. They can make it look as like Pyrenees as they can make it look like menis meniscules. Mm? And you see, it goes all the way to the Pacific. Because here you are, you recognize this building, I'm quite sure. Uh, it's in San Francisco, and it's about 1915. Well, what is Greek, Ro Roman Greek, decadent Roman Greek, Corinthian, doing hmm, by the bay? And Maybeck has many other styles. But official art demands all these splendid Corinthian columns, all this extra carving. All, all these arches and doubling and uh, uh, coupled columns and attached columns and half columns and pilasters and so on and so forth. Here's a detail. And you can see, of course, when you learn how to make this by machine, hmm, you can extrude vast, vast quantities of Corinthian, Corinthianity, hmm, like some great insanity, hmm, certainly uh, San Franciscan vanity uh, and without urbanity. Hmm, uh, it is interesting because, of course, out of, out of, against official art, all sorts of architecture, all sorts of other architecture eventually emerges. And this, you see, is a strange uh, capital, isn't it? Something has happened to it. Mm? It looks as though this chap hasn't really looked at a good Roman Corinthian order. Or he's got it all muddled up. Some imp, some Celtic imp, some twiny, whiny creature, some Art Nouveauian knit has uh, <laughs> mucked up hmm, the, the, the Roman, the neo-Roman swagger. And this is actually a column from one of the great buildings, the Wainwright uh, and the Guarantee. This is, I think, the Guarantee. Uh, uh, it's from the Guarantee building and uh, uh, done by Louis Sullivan in the 1890s. And Louis Sullivan is an enormously important architect. Uh, and you should all remember his name with great reverence, because he combines two great things. The ability to change a form of buildings in the most substantial way with great decorative gift. An ability, on the one hand, 
to be extraordinarily innovative, and on the other hand, to clothe his innovations with the most recondite and sweet uh, and suave uh, decorative details. What is, why is this such an extraordinary building for its period? You don't think it's extraordinary now, but why was it extraordinary for its period? Because it was a high-rise building, dears. Mm? And high-rise buildings occur in profusion for the first time, really, in Chicago in the late 1880s and the 1890s. And the Chicago School of Architecture, quite suddenly and astonishingly, becomes the leading school of architecture in the Western world. It is from the studio, from the atelier, from the workshop of Louis Sullivan that Frank Lloyd Wright emerges. And you can see that one of the problems that Louis Sullivan struggles with is the problem of how do you end a very tall building? Hmm? I mean, is there any reason why I shouldn't go on another 35 stories once you've got your elevator uh, and your, 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 your appropriate method of construction? How do you apply, how do you apply ornament to it? And again, what do you do at the base of such a building, at the, at the bottom? If it's going to be so high, it might have to be, and he has a choice of making it very pompous at the base or leaving it comparatively simple. And he manages to unite this whole building by this decorative strip up here, by a very subtle turning and chamfering of the corners, by, do you see, a very small eave. The eaves, of course, we now know could disappear. But ordinary roofs didn't behave in that kind of way. You either had a balustrade on top or you had eaves. Uh, and here is the Wainwright building which uh, takes it a stage further, actually. You see, this becomes much, much more, much, much more important, and these become simpler, and you have, indeed, the basic notion of a modern, modern high-rise building. Now, Louis Sullen was not the only person. Here are some of the detail. You see, and you wouldn't know that, would you? And you think of the difference between the world of Louis Sun Sullivan and the world of Skidmore Owen and Merrill, or the world of Philip Johnson of the, of the 1940s and 1950s, or the world of Mies van der Rohe, and what they have done is to get rid of all the fancifulness. And they haven't felt the need for a cornice. They haven't felt a need for an entablature. Whereas Sullivan still reads these charming little portos in uh, what looks like a very American form of acanthus. And he makes a contrast between the plain elements of the vertical, and you see, he even manages to maintain some kind of capital. Uh, but he makes a contrast with these simple vertical smooths with the horizontal, so that you read the whole building in an absolutely fascinating and extraordinary kind of way. In fact, Sullivan had done this little building, which is much less important, uh, in the early 1880s, perhaps not maybe even, in, maybe even the late 1870s, but I think early 1880s. And of course, he'd found that fundamental horizontal vertical grid with a large window space, which he then takes up again in the Carson's Piri and Scott building at the end of the 19th century, the very end. And in that, you see the playing with the corner is taken one stage further, and you have the wraparound corner, the curved corner, you have the entrance at the corner, which of course is a great commercial success, and then you have these, instead of continuous vertical strips, you have continuous horizontal strips. But again, notice the change, the amount of window to the amount of wall. And you're moving towards a structure which is separated from its curtaining. Uh, you are in fact moving towards modern architecture. Now, what was Carson's Piri and Scott? What, were, what, what was the Guarantee building? What was the Wainwright building? Interestingly enough, they're commercial rather than public official. And Carson's Piri and Scott was in fact a department store. And so it's not perhaps so surprising that you find a movement into the modern world. Chicago, why, did, why was Chicago the place where all this happened? Well, one of the reasons was because of the great fire in Chicago. Second thing was that Chicago, after the fire, the ground rent rose so much. And third, Chicago was a megapolis of commerce. It wasn't a governmental center in the way that New York or Washington or London or Berlin or Rome or Milan or so many, or Turin or so many other cities were. Uh, and that is part of it. Here's a marvelous, crusty detail. Uh, and, of course, it means that Sullivan does play to the desire still for continued richness. His, at one stage, partner and friend, Burnham, 
uh, of the Monadnock building in some ways goes even further. When you look at this, you find it very difficult to think that that's 1890 or so, the Monadnock building in Chicago. Why do you find that that's difficult to believe that it's 1890? Because of the absence of any kind of ornament, the absolute cleanliness of the lines, uh, and the scale of repetition, and the lack of a sense of hierarchy in the building. And the use, you see, of extraordinary simple materials to create a wonderful effect. A return to uh, the notion of the materials, and here is the whole thing, which, when you see it altogether, is not a little daunting. It's not a little daunting. It's extremely handsome, but it is also frightening. And it really tells you a great deal about what the 20th century is going to be like. All right, uh, so that we've seen some issues of official architecture, and of course, eventually, the officials catch up with uh, the latest modern architecture, the latest modern painting. And the bank managers uh, and the Rockefellers are all come running to be up to date and to catch up with the artists. So that eventually, Mies van der Rohe doesn't merely make a model of this kind of building, he builds this kind of building. And uh, hundreds of others do, and you get those great international firms like Skidmore, Owen, and Merrill. And here is a Skidmore building of the 1960s. And one of the things I want you to, want you to think about is how, you, how can you possibly think of an architecture to go with impressionist painting? I mean, suppose you wanted an architect, you're an architect, and you want to be influenced by Monet. What the hell would you do? <laughs> I mean, you'd obviously go and look at the Monets, and you'd say, but, you know, this is, this is, I've got to build an architecture out of, out of Harris Tweed. Hmm? Uh, and I don't know, I mean, it, it, it's all texture, and it's no, it's no structure. And uh, indeed, you know, the, 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 one of the things is that, Sculpture and architecture separate away from Impressionist painting. Uh, and indeed, one of the great problems of sculpture and architecture in the 19th century is that it, is, uh, it isn't the, 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 the dominant mode of painting doesn't help it. Whereas, if you think of this building, and now look at these paintings, you can see how early 20th century paintings really are quite helpful, aren't they? for 20th century architecture? Or is it something different? And that is somewhere around about 1900, architecture from being an ancillary decorative art becomes once again the mother of the arts, of the visual arts. Certainly one of the things that is true is that sculpture begins to come into its own again. And I want you to think now about the very fascinating, very fascinating thing, which we don't always talk about, and that is that of the so-called Impressionists, Renoir becomes more and more interested in sculpture after 1880. Degas becomes more and more interested in sculpture. And even Gauguin, who is not really, of course, an Impressionist at all, except in the very early phase, is very deeply bitten by sculpture. Uh, and this means that a change is taking place. And within the, the world of painting, you can move from the illusionistic uh, and also the textural uh, and the evanescent uh, and the casual uh, and the fugitive of not only, of course, impressions but also of Whistler, to an interest in structure which is going to shift the arts, the visual arts, towards sculpture, towards architecture, and perhaps away from painting as its own separate center. And certainly, it is, I think, fundamental to any understanding of Cezanne to realize that he is revolting against the anecdotal, but he's also revolting against the evanescent, and he is looking for a profound and geometric order. And maybe more, more fundamental than anything else, we have to think about the late 19th century and the early 20th century as looking for a new geometric ideal order. That is very apparent if you do, in fact, concern yourself with Mondrian, who was quite clearly, amongst other things, a spiritualist mystic of no mean order. 
and the Neoplatonist of no mean order, and a person who believed, if you like, in the primacy of ideas over the endless shifting sensations of the visible world. And in that sense, you see, the Impressionists are terribly old fashioned because they're so concerned with the mere world of appearance. When you move from pictorial illusionism to the world of inventive structure, which is moving from the world of painting towards the world of architecture, you may have to move, you see, in a neoplatonic, geometric, idealizing uh, direction. And uh, I want you to think about that. Monet himself, as you see, can paint architecture very nicely. But when he paints architecture, its structure disappears almost entirely. It becomes, as indeed the great Ducal Palace at Venice is, a sweltering, mystifying, uh, porridgey creature hmm, in the hot summer sun. Uh, and you can no longer really take in hmm, its sharpness. And of course, that is why I suppose Venice was particularly delightful to so many um, uh, impressionists. Or again, Monet painting in Paris. And you could see he reduced his architecture itself to uh, something uh, as uh, uncertain, hesitant, an indescribable uh, in terms of mensuration as the trees in front of it. And so you have thronging visual sensation. Well, I'm going to ask you, uh, this is a Pissarro of another boulevard, and you can see the same thing happens with Pissarro. I'm going to ask you to imagine, imagine what Impressionist sculpture would be like. Hmm? Imagine, suppose I'd set you a very fascinating task and taken this late morning and said, would you please all make a sculpture from it? It would be somewhat mystified. Mm -hmm. The people who go in for embroidery would do best, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. But I, I think it would be almost impossible to conceive this in sculptural terms. Well, obviously, sculpture found it very, very difficult. This, you see, is a, a piece by Clesinger of the 1850s or so, and it goes perfectly well with Courbet. But it doesn't really go very well with Impressionist painting. Uh, the forms are too solid, too easy to, too easy to apprehend tactilely rather than visually. Uh, and, uh, of course, to a greater extent than uh, painting, and almost as great extent as architecture, there's one other problem for sculpture in the second half of the 19th century. It is terribly, 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 terribly dominated by official art. I mean, just imagine, there you are, you're a young sculptor, and you hear that they're going to build another opera house. You think, goody, 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 goody. Hmm? There are three muses. Hmm? There are, sorry, there are three graces. There are nine muses. Uh, there are 275 famous Frenchmen. Uh, there are three million hammer dryads, and each hammer dryad has a wonderful pair of buttocks, and it's going to keep me chipping for the next 50 years. And so as a young sculptor, away you can go. And one of the greatest of them was a man called Carpo, and here is some of his sculpture for the Paris Opera. And it's called Song and Dance. And as you can see, he and his assistants were able to chip away and chip away and chip away and chip away and chip away. Uh, and many of them would become old men and go trembling off to the opera, wearing their order of the Legion of Honor, hmm? having spent a decorous life, hmm? bedizening these huge buildings with this awful uh, writhing rockery of nudity. Uh, here is another, and again, of course, think about uh, uh, officialdom loves allegory, and sculpture is, is an allegorical art. And here are the four, the four, the four seasons in it, or the four corners of the earth, or the four corners of the rainbow. Uh, you had known that there were four corners to the rainbow? Well, that doesn't matter. Uh, the allegory is sufficient uh, to uh, justify such absurdity. And they're holding the globe, which has another globe within it, which has another globe within it. And they're chained and manacled, and they've all got their nice little loincloths, because, of course, it's later in the 19th century. And, in fact, actually, you can see that it's the four continents. But would it matter very much? Mm? It's just a useful piece of useless mm -hmm, bronze, etc. Uh, much to be admired, sound and fury signifying not very much. Well, there is 
one absolutely fascinating Impressionist sculptor. And his name is Medardo Rosso. Uh, and he was an Italian uh, and eventually became an extremely large, sad, uh, and unproductive person. Hmm? You know there's a certain kind of man who, after the age of 40, looks more and more like a sort of large, decaying pear. Hmm? You know, something happens to his hips, and something happens to his stomach, and it's as though he'd swallowed an elephant without bothering to chew it. Uh, and that's rather what happened to Medardo Rosso. But as a young man, he was thin and promising, and why, just wonderfully innovative. And he does, you see, this group of people in a garden. Now, he used some very fascinating materials. He used bits of glass, and in particular, he used a good deal of wax. Why do you think he used wax? Not, not my dears, in a preliminary before casting, but he exhibited the waxes himself. Now, why? Because, of course, the wax would behave in a very specially funny way uh, in relation to the light. It would be soft and mysterious. And it would have the same kind, of, one would hope, some of the similar kind of uh, activity of light that you might get in Impressionist painting. And Medardo Rosso comes from Italy to France and works in Paris in the 1880s. He doesn't produce a large amount of work. After 1900, almost none. You know, he just sits and eats pasta. Uh, and this is a garden party, my dears. Now, isn't that interesting? You might have thought it, you might, you might not have been certain what it was at all. And look at its brevity, look at its roughness, look at the attempt to get the sort of individual touch here and there. And one, of course, of the things that it tells you about is that Medardo Rosso is trying, you see, to relate the great 19th century art of landscape to sculpture. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And Impressionist landscape even more so. I thought you might be interested to see this in relationship to, let's have a look at the next, please, uh, a Renoir. And you can see, I think, what Medardo Rosso is trying to get at, but how awfully difficult and how, in a way, totally unsuitable to sculpture Impressionist principles and aesthetics are. And let me tell you that when you go and see the Medardo Rossos, and I have seen one or two, I've never seen a whole show of them, so I perhaps shouldn't say, but I've seen a few of them, they're so disappointing. Mm? I mean, they, they're such a brave and wonderful effort, but it's so difficult to catch them in exactly the right light and get in exactly the right mood for them. And of course, when you get lots of wax covered with lots of dust, it becomes awfully dispiriting. Mm? And here, you see, is a, uh, another Renoir, and you can see how on earth do you, how on earth do you deal with this sculpturally? Well, you can see the Medardo Rosso, the kind of frenzied finger work and softness and waxiness. He does some town scenes, which are a little bit earlier, and here, you see, he's trying to get the movement, and these are, this, these are, this is a drunken couple. And in fact, it might remind you more of uh, Daumier than of any Impressionist. But you can see that he's unwilling to say where she or he leaves the ground. There's another one called The Kiss, uh, which again looks back to Daumier, but I think you can see in the, look at, look at, you see his unwillingness to be definite about anything. The, uh, you know, it, it trembles, it, it, it trembles, uh, with, uh, with uh, indeterminacy. Uh, and of course, you might want to relate it to uh, Pissarro's great boulevard uh, de Montmartre at night, uh, which also has mm, a great uh, uh, gaslight, uh, lamplight in the foreground. Well, I have talked a little bit about the problem, which is an interesting problem, the relationship of sculpture to architecture to uh, painting. And if you took a totally official point of view, it wasn't difficult. The relationship then was history. And you did scenes from Greek life, or you did buildings done in the Greek manner, or did scenes from Gothic life. You see, and so it's quite simple. And one of the ways out, of course, is what becomes called l'art nouveau. And uh, art, l'art nouveau, new art, do you see? It is, it is a definite attempt to be modern. It is also an attempt to create a style which can be applied to architecture, sculpture, painting, and not only those three, but also to ceramics, to glass, to embroidery, uh, to metalware, to every possible kind of craft. 
and I don't have time to deal with Art Nouveau properly, but here is a typical piece of Art Nouveau. It's a small detail from the enormous tomb done by a man called Alfred Gilbert. And you can see, where does the Art Nouveau come? Well, it comes in this extraordinary vegetative writhing quality. It is a decorative art, fundamentally. You can see it again in the swaying and the swirling just down here, and then in the swaying and the swirling of the, uh, of the wings themselves. Uh, sudden, sudden movements into extreme tenuosity and thinness, and then sudden movements into bulbosity. Uh, and the psychology of the movement is really rather like its uh, visual appearance. Uh, and you see that same metalwork which we saw in Gilbert uh, uh, in the tomb of the Duke of Clarence, you can see on a balcony in uh, a house, the Casa Vice, no, the Casa oh, Mila, the Casa Mila. Uh, it's an apartment block done in uh, Barcelona by the great uh, Barcelonese uh, architect Antony Gaudi. Uh, and there it is, and here's the whole thing. And there you see, on the one hand, the wonderful swaying ribs of granite. And notice, you see, he is not going to do anything. He is not going to have that official art uh, Corinthian column. Instead, the thing swells with a kind of wonderful vegetable uh, tumescence. And then that bursts into seaweed galore in the form uh, of all the metalwork. And the architecture becomes sculpture. And if you look at the interior of some buildings, they become, or the exterior, this is a Casa Batlow. The exterior becomes, in fact, an enormous canvas, an enormous fresco. Uh, and indeed, the whole thing becomes a great dragon. Uh, the roof, the roof tiles are, are hauled in. And it is a new, sudden, and really very short-lived language for all the arts. And it's enormously important because it does bring the visual arts together again. It's also enormously important because it really is the death knell of historicism. Why didn't Art Nouveau survive for longer? And I think the answer is that it was not a proletarian style. It was not a democratic style. It was not a very cheap style. And when you get Art Nouveau objects made cheap, they're also usually made rather nasty. Mm? It, is, it is expensive and rich, uh, and in some ways, you would argue, slightly decadent style. Uh, well, there is Gaudi, and you can see its richness. Uh, all these extra pieces here, and then these wonderful, again, highly vegetable uh, swellings, as though the, the roof, that, 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 that little minaret, was made out of uh, fungus. Mm? Uh, kind of lovely thing which you could eat for dinner. And look at this too, you see. But enormously complicated, rising, wonderful, and internally in its own sense, new. Uh, and here we see something, that's the entrance, I just showed the entrance to the park, Guell. Guell was a, a wealthy Barcelonese, and he commissioned uh, Gaudi to make a great park. And this is just a little bit of a seat in it. And there you see what I mean when it is, in fact, of course, a style which is pictorial, sculptural, and architectural. And uh, so you can see it in Barcelona, you could also see it in Glasgow, you could see it in Nasi, but one great, great place for seeing it was in, uh, uh, there's another bit of uh, uh, Gaudi. Uh, let's have a look at the next. Come on, go on, go on, go on. Uh, and you hardly know the difference, do you? But this is from the Viennese version. Mm? With its uh, lovely little, its lovely little uh, journal, Versacrum, and of course the new, the new art, Art Nouveau, Le Stil Liberty, etc. It has different names in different countries. It is also Jugendstil in, 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 in Vienna. It is, it's propagandized by the new art journals. The Anglo-American one being called The Studio, which still, or until recently, existed. Now you can see how close to uh, 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 Gaudi at the Park Güell is the wonderful Gustav Klimt. This is actually a design for a mural in the Palais Stockle, which was designed by a Belgian Art Nouveau called Victor Orta. And here is another splendid Gustav Klimt from the 1890s, 1900s. You can see that, of course, no artist, however much he wants to produce Art Nouveau and new art, can ever really totally escape from the past. And what past is it that Klimt can't escape from? The Neo-Byzantine. Hmm? It's as though he just plundered Ravenna. 
hmm? and got all those wonderful mosaic things. Here's another splendid uh, clint of Danai. And uh, I show it to you proudly because uh, it is, in places you see, as flat as the back of your hand. Uh, it, the, these little bits of decoration uh, remind you actually of Minoan ornament, which was being discovered about this sort of time. And together with uh, this uh, uh, delight in uh, vegetable and uh, recondite and rare ornament is also, of course, a delight in uh, sexual mysteries uh, of a fascinating kind. And if we move to Vienna, which you can read about in one of the books by Charles, Charles Chorsky or Toulmin, oh, there are lots and lots of books of, about Vienna. Why are there so many books about Vienna uh, at the end of the 19th century? Do you know why? Because we have to remember that not only was George Bernard Shaw uh, a young man and uh, Henry Gibson, an old man, and uh, Strindberg, a youngish man, but not a very young man, and uh, Munch, uh, no longer a very, very young man. But Sigmund Freud was, what, 40 or so by 1900? Sigmund Freud was somewhat older than Kandinsky, and only a very little bit younger than Vincent van Gogh. And Klimt painted in the same city. And he's a wonderful painter, he's quite extraordinary kind. And then in Bavaria, I mean in Munich, you see, you have, uh, this, is, this is a photo photographic uh, atelier, and you have there the quintessential uh, essence of this new style, highly ornamental, obviously borrowing from Hokusai's wave, obviously uh, in some way related to thistles or, or nasturtiums, some way related to women's hair, in some way related to some kind of ectoplasm or orgasm, uh, and uh, also related to uh, 18th century Rococo, and uh, quite wonderful and weird, but decorative and spanning from the world of architecture to the world of embroidery. And here is a little piece of uh, uh, late 19th century Art Nouveau embroidery by a man called Aubrist. Uh, the, uh, photography studio, the photographic studio was by a man called Endel. And you see, look how it rises. Look at its extraordinary new fresh energy, uh, an energy of release from official art. And an energy which gets into all the arts. And one of the things I think that you could say about the 20th century in the visual arts is that it is not at all clear which art is the leading visual art. Is it architecture, or is it sculpture, or is it embroidery, or is it indeed ceramics? Oh, there's one moment in the, in the 20th century, the moment when dear old Bernard Leach is in his 80s, when you might think the ceramics was the leading art, or is it indeed the cinema, or the video, or is it going to be calligraphy? when the West finally gives up word processing. Anyhow, uh, I can't dally too long with Art Nouveau, but I can just remind you that it has its American, uh, its American branch in the world of Tiffany, and of course it's wonderfully applied to new objects like electric lamps. Mm, it is also applied to very old objects like hand mirrors. And you see, here the peacock's neck is wonderfully elongated and rise absolutely marvelously. The whole thing is wonderfully rich, and it's such a, such a luxurious little object, isn't it? Mm, so, so delicious. Oh, how I wish I could afford to buy that for my sweetheart. But nowadays, it would probably cost you $200,000 or something. Mm -hmm. Even then, mm, it wasn't available, I think, at the cheapest of dime stores. Uh, I doubt whether... Only very inferior versions were available at the burgeoning Woolworths of the period. But, so we've seen a really complex problem. We've seen the problem of the arts falling apart and then coming together in Art Nouveau, and we want to place, we want to place uh, Impressionism within this, with its great disturbing aspects. Well, let us remember that Impressionism is, in some sense, a short-lived movement, and this is, in fact, a painting by Renoir. Now, why is this a surprise as a painting by Renoir? because it is quite clearly not a one of his charming uh, maidservants or mistresses or something like that. It is a portrait of who? Diana, because there she is. I mean, Victorian ladies did not run about the undergrowth with nothing on, with quiverfuls of arrows. Uh, if you want to see what a toxophilist looked like, you go to the paintings of W.P. Frith. 
but this is meant to be Diana, and it was for, and I think it got into the 1868 or 1869 salon. You see, the official, it was, it was so difficult. Did you or didn't you join the academy? Were you or were you not official? Do you know, did you get a job in the university, so to speak, or didn't you get a job in the university? You think of the agony for almost everybody of any intelligence, and, uh, and now it does. Do they belong to the establishment or not? And the trouble was that it was very, very difficult to be uh, very anti-establishment if you were in the visual arts because you can't easily earn a living. What made it even more difficult was because, I mean, people like Michael Bakunin were such odd creatures, the great anarchist. And Freud, um, 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 Marx was, honestly speaking, I think from a, a, a visual artist's point of view, an incredibly depressing phenomenon. And I think Marx, for a visual artist's point of view, remains an incredibly depressing uh, uh, phenomenon. Communism is it, it's just, somehow it's depressing to the arts. It may be that the, the visual arts need an atmosphere of such awful luxury. Though equally well, I mean, you know, modern capitalism, neo-late, bulging, boiling, tumescent, Rotten capitalism, I don't know what, what is the latest phrase for the post-capitalist epoch. Advanced, lousy capitalism, I don't know what it is, but anyhow, it's, it's, it's equally sort of depressing. But to all of you don't know what to do. And Manet, had, Manet, had, Manet was always interested in the, the salon. To the end of his life, Cezanne was mortified when his pictures didn't get into the academy. You know that Duane Rousseau would trundle on a handcart, hmm, his great visions of tropical forests, to the academy. And so it's not so surprising to find Renoir doing that. And it is, of course, more surprising, more brave, and more interesting. Diana, though no Victorian lady trotted about the undergrowth without the underwear, uh, nonetheless, Diana, you see, was, was, an, official, was an official person. Hmm? Whereas these common or garden soubrettes and uh, uh, midinettes and so on, uh, the Moulin de la Galette, they were not official, they were the, they were the understomach, they were the, they were the lower classes, they were the rabble. Uh, and uh, Renoir managed to paint them, and of course he moves from a very linear situation to this wonderful dapple light, and I think this is one of the great masterpieces uh, of Impressionism. It's a genuine Impressionist painter, painting, and yet it has an extraordinary and complex organization. The difficulty, of course, was to maintain a balance between the possibility of seeming very casual. You notice, in fact, that there are a whole series of fascinating diagonals which are then broken up by uh, a whole series of verticals, uh, and the organization of this is immensely subtle. But, of course, it isn't really quite an impression. Hmm? And it moves again, not towards so much official art, but to classical art. And Renoir is torn between these poles. And you see, towards the end of the 1870s, he does his portrait of Madame Charpentier, uh, and its relationship to Titian, its relationship to Rubens, is, I think, available to you under the surface. On the other hand, the actual means of doing some of the detail is still highly impressionist. At the end of the 1870s, Renoir, beginning of the 1880s, Renoir goes to Italy. Now, I want you to think what that means. It means, of course, that he is pulled towards the sculptural. He's pulled towards the great repositories of sculpture, of ancient sculpture and Renaissance sculpture in Rome. Even more, he goes to Naples and sees the whole of the classical world revived in front of his eyes. And there is an astonishing change in a great deal of his art. One thing that happens is that uh, here it is just on the brink of these changes. Very modern, very mundane. And then you see what happens. It's extraordinary, isn't it? There's about four or five years from that uh, breakfast at Bougival, I think it's called, to the parapluie. And now look at the return of line everywhere. Look at the return of solid volume. Here, here. You could bite that arm. Hmm? You could smack that shoulder. Of course, uh, only if you're a rather unpleasant person. Uh, but I wanted to get across to you the intense sense of of, of volume that's... Became. Now, it's not everywhere. In, if you look at the face of this small child, or if you look at this face and this hair, but the dominant shapes of the umbrellas themselves, and then the return, you see, to an ellipse like this, uh, a world of geometry and volume is reappearing. 
Along with that, come, uh, Renoir becomes much more deeply interested in the nude, and the nude becomes a different thing. Nude becomes enormously solid mm, and, uh, and, and palpable uh, and absolutely lacking in accident. I mean, the difference between this nude and uh, Manet's Olympia, which is so uh, realist in its point of view, so determined to say, well, all human beings uh, are really rather skimpy and dreadful creatures. Whereas this is idealizing. This is going back to classical sculpture. And of course, as Renoir got older, and as his hands became more and more gnarled by, uh, what do you call it? Arthritis. Hmm? As he needed more and more assistance, he turns more and more to sculpture. And it's very, very interesting. What is the subject matter here? It goes back to the Diana. This is what? Come on! It's the judgment of Paris. Here is Paris, here is uh, Venus, here is uh, uh, Minerva, and here is... Uh, uh... No, we can't have Venus and Aphrodite, that's the same person. I get my Greek and my Roman, and here is Mercury or Hermes. It's, it's the judgment of Paris. It's all familiar to you. It's, of course, a classical myth. But it's even more interesting than the painting is the absolutely superb and wonderful relief which uh, Renoir does. And uh, it becomes an absolutely, let's have a look at this, absolutely wonderful sculptor. And here's a, a version of his Venus, which has been taken indoors. Uh, it's been out of doors for a long time, and it's got all that wonderful uh, patina. Marvelous, marvelous thing. And of course, what I say about uh, Renoir from the 1880s, for, uh, 1881, he ceases really to be an Impressionist. In the 1890s, he's becoming sculptor's first painter. Same thing is true, of course, for Degas, except that it's more questionable whether Degas ever was a sculpt, uh, was a was an impressionist, and Degas finds it more easy to move into the world of sculpture. It's again with Degas not a problem of, of arthritis, but a problem of less and less good eyesight, and a change in preoccupation. And uh, it starts, of course, with actually not this, but the next one, which uh, he exhibited, and I think it's almost the only sculpture he actually exhibited during his life. And of course, it's violent and wonderfully. Wonderfully original affair. It isn't just that she's a little opera rat, she's just a little ballet rat, she's just a little young, skimpy girl uh, in the corps de ballet, but she is clothed, you see, in mixed media, including uh, ordinary cloth. Uh, and he draws attention to uh, the wrinkles in her tights. This is very, very faded. It must have originally been quite bright in color, uh, do you see? And what that then looks towards is all the kind of sculptural freedoms of the 20th century, from mixed media to assemblage. And in a sense, she's already in part an assemblage creature, because the, this part is not really made by Degas at all. It's borrowed from uh, some other kind of maker. Well, I said that Degas never fully been impressionist. Of course, in the 1860s and early 1870s, he explores certainly impressionist subject matter. He starts off by doing, by traveling to Italy, as Manet traveled to Italy. He's a well-to-do of Italian origins, which is interesting, has lots of Italian, lots of, has lots of Italian relatives. So he knows perhaps Italian art rather better than, some, than, for instance, Renoir does, certainly much more than Monet. Monet is not really very deeply versed in art history. He's less versed in art history even than uh, Courbet. Uh, different with Degas. But Degas can do, do you see, a little beach scene, which we've seen is one of the great impressionist things. Or he can do a day at the races, which was uh, a subject much loved by Manet. And it's fascinating to see in the 1860s a painting, and then, of course, much, 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 much later, he gets down to it and he explores equine anatomy uh, sculpturally. Most of these sculptures were l left in his studio. There's a wonderful description of of Degas in his old age, and his hair is all down over his eyes, and he gropes, and he can't really see anything very much except his own work. Hmm? When he goes to an auction, and he sees a good painting of his going for a large sum of money, and wonders whether to buy it back in, then his eyesight is good. But the, the relationship between the eye and the hand changes, and he makes all these waxes, and they're cast after he's dead. And a wonderful description of, of this huge table, and some of the girls have fallen over, and some of the horses are in pieces, because he's not interested in the technical aspects at all. And that, of course, is one of the great problems of our sculpture. The artist refuses to be interested in the technical aspects. He gets some workmen to do it, until around about 1900 to 1910, when quite suddenly 
people like Bancusi and Gaudia Breschka actually cut directly into the metal. But they've been preceded by one very important artist we've seen in a moment. Anyhow, here's Degas doing his horse. And there's a much later group of horses in the, from the 1870s. And it's more in tune with a rather different and quite extraordinary horse. Because you can see that Degas becomes absolutely fascinated by the issue of muscular motion. And uh, he may, of course, be prompted this by the fact that he's so e deeply interested in photography. And certainly, when he does his bathers, his sculptural bathers, and his sculptural uh, ballet dancers, as, just as he does his uh, pastels, again, his failing eyesight. Oh, please focus that in. Yes, come on. Or go on to the next one. There we are. Look at that quite extraordinary and wonderful thing. And the, the, the vigor and economy of these shapes uh, and their easy following leads to the early sculpture of Matisse. Uh, OK, let's go on. Let's have a look at the next, because uh, now look at this wonderful thing. Of course, human beings have not been seen in postures like this. this is absolutely, that's an unofficial posture, my dear. Mm -hmm. Now you think about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more important than you think. And that's an e equally unofficial posture. Let's have a look at the next. Uh, and uh, another. Uh, intimate, detailed posture, and that, I mean, nobody had been allowed to do that for years and years and years in art. In fact, it's still not really, uh, uh, I mean, not really permitted just to dry your feet. Hmm? Uh, your dignity is lost. Another wonderful one, which I, of uh, two figures, and this is a very fascinating, it's called the massage or the drying or something. Uh, just occasionally, Degas manages to get into two figures. Wonderfully inventive. All, all that was, of course, almost entirely unknown. Everybody thought he was a grand old painter with a little beard and walk around, you know, and make rude remarks about women. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, he's a very fascinating person, uh, distasteful and yet, yet marvelous. Uh, and all the time, secretly doing this, this uh, uh, sculpture. And of course, it, 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 in one sense, yes, there are, there are possibilities of impressionism. In the other sense, it moves away. I, 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 I really, when I look at this uh, projected, I wonder whether it is indeed what the slide library told me it was. Uh, guess, guess quickly. It's an early Gauguin. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and Gauguin, you see again, uh, this is another early, uh, early Gauguin of Copenhagen, where his wife was from, you remember. Uh, and it's an impressionist world. This should be an impressionist world because of the snow, but you know it just, just isn't. I mean, because of the kind of linear structure here, because of the kind of color. And Gauguin soon moves away from the world of Pissarro, the world of, 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 of Monet, into his own world. There's another late 1880s Pont Avant one, and then into the world of Tahiti. But you see, accompanying and much less well known than his paintings is a fascination with there's a fascination with sculpture. And I think you would have to say, interestingly enough, that his sculpture is more far out than his painting. And this is a very nice piece of sculpture. And uh, I'll leave you with the motto of it for today, which is, soyez, soyez amoureuse et vous serez heureuse. Be loving, dears, and you will be happy. And I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>